Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki. Welcome to the 425th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and another virtual Imagine lecture hosted by the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. This 10 week summer series focuses on creating a culture of sustainability. In effect, we're asking the question, what would a sustainable community look like? So we've asked folks from the educational sector, UB uh, in particular, uh, the public sector, the private sector, and the not-for-profit sector. And that's uh, who's today's speaker will represent. Thank you so much for joining us today. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History, and Nature, or as I pronounce the acronym, Cezanne and imaginelifelonglearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels. And we hope you will share the link with your friends and networks. As a reminder, Life Willing will be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Today's featured speaker is Michelle Urbanchik. Michelle is a seasoned leader and non-for-profit executive with over 24 years of high-level fundraising, programming, strategic planning, financial oversight, and business management experience at SUNY Oswego. She earned her bachelor's degree in education and her master's degree in vocational technical education and business administration. Mrs. Urbanchek is currently the CEO of Explore and More Children's Museum, which has opened a new museum at Canal Side in 2019. She has also served as president of EPIC, Every Person Influences Children, development director with the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences, and project associate at the University Center for Academic and Workforce Development Research in Albany. She is a 2011 Leadership Buffalo graduate and a 2017 recipient of the Business First Woman of Influence Award. Now, let's welcome Michelle Urbanchin. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today um, to really continue this series on sustainability. Um, it was kind of how we came together was Dennis happened to be in the museum and we were going through and we were just talking about sustainability and we were talking about the exhibits, how we were built, um, what we're trying to teach children. And then Dennis said, okay, you need to be part of the series. And we were just talking before we came on. And the question really is, is what does a sustainable community look like? Um, and involving children is probably one of the best pieces of that puzzle because we really want to teach children from really infancy of growing up and becoming good stewards of our planet and really understanding what sustainability means. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today and share some things. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end. If anyone has any questions, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, and then I'll put my email at the end. So if anyone has anything offline they'd like to talk to me about, I welcome it. And I always welcome suggestions and things that we can do to really move this dial forward. Um, a little bit about Explore More. We were built specifically for children. Why we're in this beautiful building at Canal Side, when you come in, we're built for children. So when we talk about our social story, the story is about Western New York, from its local people, local culture, local products, local history. Really, our job is to get children from really zero to about 10 to have a passion for the community. And it's through a variety of areas, which I'm gonna cover a few of them. If we do our job right, 
they will then become, you know, the stewards of the cultures, the planet, the world, history, science, um, and then they grow to become really good patrons of other cultural organizations as they grow into adulthood, which is one of the things that I think we're most excited about. But children's museums have always played an important role in really telling the sustainability story. So I'm going to share a little bit about how we came to our journey. If I could just be host, I think she made me host. So I'm just going to put my PowerPoint. Does everyone have that on their screen? No. Okay. Well, I don't think I'm host then. You should be able to click the share screen button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Ah, uh, there we go. You got me. Now you'll see me. Does everyone have me now? We do. Yep. There it is. Awesome. So we're going to go to start the slideshow. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Um, again, our building. And we talk a little bit about the building. And when we look at the building, we have to look at really a couple things as we move forward. And one is how we built the building um, with our belief. And really, when you talk about our belief, our belief is actually teaching by example will have a greater effect on a child's behavior than telling the child what to do. Um, and we believe that why children are good listeners, they're also really good at visual and they're visual learners. So we really need to teach children by hands-on experiences and different things that they can do um, to understand the planet around them. So when we look at sustainability from our area, I'm going to be talking about out the outside environment, our building, the exhibits, the materials, and the people. And why this is important is when we teach sustainability, it's maintained support, and we teach children about the world we live in um, by acting responsible. And really what we're trying to do is teach children that they need to maintain all our precious resources for the next generation, so for future generations. And it's really hard for a five-year-old because if you ask a five-year-old what future generations are, they don't really know. So our whole job is to really get children to understand um, how to really love the resources we have. And we do this by a variety of ways, by teaching through hands-on exhibits, books, reading about climate change, talking about it, doing art projects, um, lessons in the studios, being good stewards. Um, and by example, modern behavior. The whole thing is to make it a lifestyle choice for our children. So one of the things we look at is, how do you get to the museum? Uh, we are Buffalo, New York. I always laugh when people say that um, we have the Metro Rail and the bus and the bikes and why we are really pushing that next generation and future generations to become the public transit. And we love it and really accept it. COVID-19 has kind of put a little bit of a wedge in there. And the reason why is because parents used to come down by the Metro Rail and with the pandemic, it has made them pause a little bit. So, you know, this will be something to look for when we go to future, which I'm really excited about in telling that story. We look at how people came into the building, the building design, um, reducing our consumption. So when we look at that, it's uh, what are our hours of operation? Um, how are we energy efficient? Do our HVAC systems work to maximize heating and cooling through our changing seasons? Do we use a lot of natural light? And we do. So that has us not having a dependency on electricity by using the natural light through the windows. Um, as everything on a timer, is everything, do our lights automatically shut off when we're not using it? Um, how energy efficient are our appliances? We have industrial dishwashers here. We have washing machines because of our manipulatives. How energy efficient are they? Um, when you come in, are we e-ticketing? Are we passing out a paper ticket? No, we e-ticket. Um, and do we have paperless maps? We do not have any maps. Um, and in the beginning, that kind of made people pause, but we don't have maps. Um, everything could be done online, or we have monitor screens that are wayfinding that tells families how to get from one place to another. When we look at um, our exhibits, we're looking at, again, local. Um, and when we talk about it, it is, what is our exhibit saying? Is it public awareness? Is it environmental, economic? Are we teaching social sustainability through these exhibits? And these are questions we ask not only um, with brain development, but how are we teaching this? And how do we teach a healthy and sustainable um, future for child development? 
Um, and then how do we teach sustainability habits through civic engagement? And so when we look at this, this is just rooms that we have a West Side Bazaar and we have Hispanic Heritage as part, but what we're teaching is sharp local. Um, it's better for the environment, support local businesses, invest in your community. Um, and it also helps with the job and the, the economy. Um, but it's also you know, racing that you know, footprint of, can you walk to your local stores and can you support them? We look at exhibits that talk about water. Um, we are, of course, water, we love it. But when we talk about electricity, how is electricity generated? Um, we talk about conservation, being good stewards of water. One of our favorite things is we just uh, installed a um, car wash. And why, you know, most people don't think of car wash as sustainability, it actually is. Um, and it's really using the reuse, repurpose in water through the water filtration through a car wash is really reusing the water. And we teach that through an exhibit of a filtration system and how it does it. And then we teach about a car wash and helping reduce the pollution by saving on water, saving on soap, saving on things that might go into the waterways. Another thing we do is we also teach in our cafe about recycling and how that helps the water and the planets. Um, this is one of my favorites and this is something Dennis and I talked about when he was here, but one of the things we really teach is tools, you know, holding on to tools. So we have, you know, what we call our pretend tools to get kids used to seeing what they are. Um, and then there's areas inside the museum, such as what I'm showing you right now, of framing a house, plumbing, um, again, hands-on. We really want our children to have that experience of fixing. And so we're going to go to here, which is our car. Um, and this came to me um, when I was sh actually shopping for a car with my daughter and saw that there were so many auto technician positions open in Western New York. And this was pre-COVID. And in just talking and learning more about it, it was because there was not a lot of vocational education programs that were teaching children the importance of fixing um, and hands-on and learning. And so we not only teach, you know, careers, but we're teaching how do you fix it and literacy around an air filter, um, changing a tire, um, things of that nature that really a lug nut and teaching kids literacy to get them to understand words that might help them have a passion of doing and fixing and uh, learning. These are some areas we have tinkering. Um, again, we have real tools and we have um, pretend tools. And we love when the real, real tools come out age appropriate, of course, because we learn that kids are touching these tools for the first time. Um, I often joke here that, you know, when as soon as my father left for work, we were at this tool bench all the time. We were hammering and doing things that we shouldn't have done, but it was like playland to us. Um, and that's what kids are missing now is that hands-on of really, can I fix this or do I replace it? Um, can we reuse things? And that's really what we're trying to teach is again, those three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. How can we teach that? What you're also seeing here is um, some of the creations our kids made. We do an awful lot of reusing. Um, and you're seeing all different types of art projects and hands-on activities we use, just using recycled materials to create um, and expand a child's mind. And that's probably one of the things that we're really good in is at the end of the year, our supply line is not high at all here um, because we really take in a lot of everybody's kind of um, recycling to figure out how we can reuse it to create something different. And that's probably one of the things that the education team um, has done really well is how do we reuse in all of our studios, which is something really great. Um, again, we have our farm and the beauty of our farm is really to teach about really the local farmers um, reusing, um, you know, how do you plant things? How do you um, support local farmers and farmers efforts, but also how not to waste food. One of the things that Americans do quite a bit is we throw away an awful lot of food. So how do we compost? How do we teach about gardening? How do we teach about recipes of using things or freezing things or um, 
just understanding what consumption really looks like. And we do that through the farm and really teaching kids a love of where food comes from. Um, and then kids can sell it at the farmer's market and then they could cook it in a cooking galley, um, a pretend, and we also have a real cooking area, which you know is a lot of fun for the kids because then they're actually doing a hands-on. Um, but it's understanding where food comes from. One of our last areas is our terrace. Um, this is the terrace showing without a garden on it, um, but we tend to have a garden. Um, our classes use the vegetables in our cooking kitchen, which is really a lot of fun, but the kids get to grow the vegetables on the terrace, and then we use them as a part of our camp programs or our cooking programs, which really teaches kids um, growing it from a seed and then actually eating it with a recipe. Um, and there's something really magical about that because I think there's a connection to the earth of, wow, I, you know, this actually grew and we did that. And that makes it a lot of fun. On top of, we have our windmill and uh, teach about wind power. I'm gonna stop sharing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the exhibits um, and show you a little bit about the exhibits and things within the exhibits, you're seeing a lot of natural light. Um, the museum is surrounded by windows, which makes it really friendly, not only sensory friendly, but it's, sense, it's actually friendly for the planet. Um, we're not using the electricity. But our goal is to motivate children to explore and ask questions. And so when you talk about what does a sustainable community look like, it's how do we teach children to ask questions about the world we live in? How do we do that? And then we'll know, did we provide the activities and exhibits that might have a deep and meaningful impact? Did we do that? Um, and do children feel better about the world we live in? And I think the only way we're gonna do that is if we provide experiences for children to have hands-on to see that there's other things that they can be doing to help. Um, when we talk about sustainability, everyone always says, well, you just plant a garden. And that's what people think when it comes to children, just plant a garden. And we talked about sustainability but it's deeper than that. It's really a cultural from understanding the community, understanding how you get to places, understanding what you do when you're there, um, how you know, lights are on. It's just a variety of interconnectedness that we're teaching in the museum. Um, and I always say subliminally because kids don't know they're learning it. They just passionately pick it up and do that. But did we provide a positive and stimulating learning environment? Are our children gonna grow up and become these stewards of the planet that make the, the environment sustainable? So that's where we are. DJ? I think I covered that in 10 minutes, Dennis. Did I do good? <laughs> that was a lot, that was a lot in 10 minutes. But I wanted to show you a little bit about the exhibits. Michelle, that was a great overview and, uh, and per right uh, on target. I always like to start with uh, J.D. Hartman, who's uh, co-hosting this whole series with me. Uh, J.D., uh, let, let's first invite everyone to uh, submit some questions in the chat room. And while they're doing that, uh, what, what, uh, what yeah. questions might you have? Thank you, Michelle. That was uh, wonderful. And, you know, the message of being a good steward of the planet is essential. And the sooner we get started on that, the better. So I, I'm really appreciative of the work you do with children. Um, I was just wondering, you know, that since it's an essential message, how, how are, what type of efforts are, are you undertaking to make sure that there's kind of a diversity of children that reflects our city? For example, 46% of our population is non-white. So what type of, what, what are you doing in that regard? Well, that's something that, you know, we're pleased to say we don't have that issue. So our museum is very diverse from our um, board to our staff to our audience. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we were looking today of where our analytics are. So we pay quite, a, you know, close attention to our analytics. Where, who's opening up our social media? Who's purchasing our tickets? We look at zip codes. Um, and one of the things that we have done really well is we've created an inclusive environment. So children and families feel very welcome. 
Um, and so that's one of the things that um, was really important to us when we moved down, not only to be an economic driver here at Canal Side, but to represent the community in which we reside in. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to report that that has been an ongoing effort through a variety of grants, sponsorships, and just our community coming in and really embracing the museum. Yeah, well, that, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. You mentioned you, you do measurements, which I'm a... I come from the private sector and I'm a numbers guy. So it's good to hear that you actually are measuring your, your, um, your audience as well as let's say your staff and board, as you mentioned. So that's great. It's a monthly so, uh, analytics, JD. It's, it's, it's just monthly. <laughs> I love it. That's good to hear because um, you know, intent only gets us so far. So that's mm -hmm. great. Um, I'm gonna, I have a couple other questions, but I, I think there may be one in the chat and um, is yep. there one in the, in the chat? Yep. Do we have yes, questions? We do have audience? a few questions. Let's hear. Um, Let's what, hear. what age range does the museum target and what is the cost for a family to visit the museum? Sure, so our um, age really is zero to 10. We say with a sweet spot in between two and eight. I say that, but we have grown up nights of play. Um, next week we have senior trips here. Um, I think the thing is, is the museum is so friendly. People want to play. They want to touch. They want to do the hands-on. I have um, just recently we had a family come through just visiting with their teenagers and said, I wish we had this when I was little. Um, and it's one of those things we get um, quite a bit. But it's really, it's really intended for children, even though I always say we're teaching this way. Sometimes our exhibits are teaching adults as well. Um, and that's a lot of fun. Um, the family to visit, it depends on when you're coming or time of year. Um, it's normally an $11 price point um, per person to come into the museum. We do specials of pay what you can quite a bit. Um, and we do 716 promotions. We did that for about three months. Leah, any other questions? Those are all the questions. Thank you. Well, then good, we can continue our discussion. Uh, I, I've got, let's start with the, with the difficulty. You just opened uh, and suddenly uh, a COVID virus uh, attacks the world. Uh, how, how have you managed to survive literally during that period of time? I can't believe everybody was rushing to explore and more. We're just getting back maybe to, we hope, some normalcy and then suddenly have a Delta uh, variant. But uh, I, I, how, how will you engage the community once we do get back based on having almost a trial period uh, to uh, connect with the community before COVID did hit? Um, well, you know, we did all this planning. You know, I, I sh think I shared with you all the planning we did to get make sure we were in the building and it was friendly and welcoming. Um, you know, we closed after nine months. Uh, we are 98.5% self, you know, revenue. So it's earned revenue, which means we have to sing for our supper. So that's rentals, admission, <laughs> memberships, group sales, all of which were basically eliminated um, through COVID. And even when we reopened, we opened at about a 12%, climbed to 25 and right now we're hovering around 60%. My audience is different, um, you know, they're children and they're children who don't know social distancing. So when everyone said, oh, you gotta stay apart, if children don't understand that concept, they're not gonna do it. They cling to everything and each other. Um, but during the pandemic, you know, I, we had great support. I have to say our business community was our number one support keeping us afloat. Um, it was really a lot of our donors who really, um, you know, knew the importance of the museum and keeping the museum um, viable and sustainable. So Dennis, when you asked me about sustainability, I laugh because I'm thinking <laughs> financial sustainability or planet sustainability, because that word is so interchanged here quite a bit at the museum. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, July, we had one of our, our busiest months we've had, even at our capacity and our reduced hours. It was actually, you know, 2019 numbers all of July, um, which um, was amazing. But it also told me the community wanted to come out. But when we do focus groups, which we do quite a bit and a lot of feedback, we know our parents are worried about that variant and we know they're getting out while they can. 
um, just in case, you know, something comes back and they have to, you know, hunker down in the winter time. So we, we recognize that. Go ahead, JD, did you have a yeah. question? Yeah, just, and thank you, because just a quick comment on, you know, the, the financial sustainability and the sustainability of the planet. You know, they, the, some of the, the good news is that they're not mutually exclusive, that actually mm -hmm. being a good steward of the planet is good for business. So, um, but another question, you mentioned history a couple of times, how, you know, the explore more is rooted in, in, in this local history. And, you know, the, the more I learn about uh, the Haudenosaunee, the more amazed I am at their contributions to thoughts around democracy at the formation of our, of, the United States, but also, you know, they're, they're uh, seven generations. You've mentioned stewardship and history. So do you guys have any programming around the Haudenosaunee's uh, seven generation concept and not just concept practice? Yes, actually we do. Um, so it's so funny you mentioned history. We are not the history museum. Cause so no. Lisa Brown from the history museum would say, Michelle, we're not that. What we teach with our history, we do actually partner with the history museum to provide that as well as um, some of our other culturals we have cause they're the experts in it. Um, mm -hmm. But what we do is we tell our story. So when we talk about history, we're telling history of sports, history of electricity, companies. So you're going to see a variety of companies tell their stories throughout. Um, you're going to see cultures throughout Buffalo's generation. So those houses I showed you in the beginning of Westside Bazaar and Rican House, we already had a Seneca Nation house that told mm -hmm. variety of stories. And we also had a Yemen house. We've switched them over. So believe it or not, we do a lot of switching over of these homes to show various cultures and various histories throughout. But then we have docent carts in education programming that offset and tell things. So every Friday we have folk art Fridays that really cover a lot of the history. Great, thank you. I think there's another question in the uh, chat. Yeah, Leah, we have ours and I, we're getting some sound feedback. So if anybody's uh, got sound, please click off your audio if you, if you could. Uh, yes, we do have one question. Um, go ahead, Leah. Can gift certificates be purchased, especially for holiday giving? Yes, actually we have um, gift cards. So we have gift cards, um, which can be purchased at any time. Um, there actually is a Shop 716 promotion, so I'll do my Erie County 200 plug. Um, but there is, in September, there's going to be a Shop 716 gift card promotion, which means if you buy a $25 gift card, you actually get a $25 gift card free to, you know, the same place or anywhere else. Um, so if you're looking for holiday shopping, you might want to really watch out for that promotion in September. Um, I bought a lot of really good gift cards to all different local um, businesses. So it's a good way to, to actually, when we're talking about sustainability, shop local. Um, and promote local. I'm, I'm aware of one uh, other promotion and, and hopefully there'll be many more that develop around Canal Side and the Buffalo Waterfront. But uh, on Wednesday afternoons, if you uh, uh, go on the Miss Buffalo uh, uh, boat tour, uh, children are free, uh, 12 and under when accompanied by an adult. Uh, and then that free ticket allows you to get to explore and more uh, with the same idea that the child is free uh, with one paying adult uh, and and also for the heritage uh, carousel and the naval park. So uh, the attempt is there to get families on Wednesday afternoons in July and August um, yep, uh, before Labor Day, September 1st is there. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. And again, more and more, I hope uh, the community will start to get creative with how do we get families midweek during the summer there. Michelle, there's no five-year-olds walking into your place alone, I doubt. No, uh, they're not. They all bring a parent or two and they're a guardian and adults. So what you're teaching children, you're really teaching dialogue with child and parents. That's my take. Is that yours? 
Absolutely. Um, and I love that promotion for Wednesdays. I think it's really a lot of fun. Um, I love that parents are coming down. Uh, we also have our free vehicles every Wednesday and Friday. It's our uh, touch a truck. Um, we'll have a big event at the end of August, but if you are down here anyway, um, and you're taking part in any of these activities that Dennis has mentioned, it's also another thing happening here um, at Canal Side. So it's a lot of fun. And it's nice to have the parents come down and it's nice to see the variety of activities. So. Channel 4 did a nice piece on it last Wednesday. Uh, I was part of that and it uh, it's called Waterfront Wednesdays uh, Children Cruise Free. And that kicks off engagement with uh, on any future Wednesday with uh, these other attractions uh, mm -hmm. at the Buffalo Waterfront and Canal side. It's a lot of fun. Good, Perfect. good, glad you're part of it. Let's get creative. JD, pass the word to the uh, group. JD is a, a member of, uh, and, and we had him earlier in the year, uh, the, the organization. Uh, it's called Western New York Sustainable Business Roundtable. And uh, uh, a lot of organizations in the private sector uh, connecting with the, with the public sector uh, have been showing best, best models, best cases sharing information. Now, do you want to comment on that, J.D., before we wrap up? Yeah, thanks, Dennis. You know, I thought that there may actually, and when Michelle said that uh, they basically have to, what was it, you have to sing for your Sing for supper? my supper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I know corporate sponsorship's important, so maybe we can reach out from the Sustainable Business Roundtable to the, you know, to the music, Children's Museum. There may be some synergy there. Um, yeah, I, I think you look to, to create a culture, culture of sustainability uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a monumental task and, and it's all hands on deck. As Dennis mentioned, nonprofit, for-profit or private and in the, in the public sector. So uh, that, that's really where the Sustainable Business Roundtable has come in, is, is looking to organize local businesses. It doesn't matter, it's from the largest M&T, uh, rich products right down to businesses of my size that, you know, sharing best practices to, to actually, you know, get things done. This is a, we're, we're, we're a think and do tank in other words. So anyway, that's a little plug for the sustainable business round data. You deserve it. We, we try to get those in once in a while. Folks, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, unless Leah, any last question, a, a short one that we can get in? There is one last question. Let's um, do it. Is the staff mandated to be vaccinated against COVID? Uh, we have no policy in place for that. Um, we didn't need to put a policy in place. Um, our staff is 100% vaccinated by their choice, so it, we did not have to put a policy in place. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. All we right. didn't have to, a necessary policy we didn't need, right? <laughs> we didn't have to put one. It's like, check, okay. But um, I, I respect other businesses on how challenging that is. And, you know, fortunately for us, we didn't have to, to worry about that. All right. Well, we're going That's to great. wrap mm -hmm. this up. Michelle, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dennis. You're quite welcome. Uh, that was perfect. Uh, we, uh, again, thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, uh, this is a 10 week series. This is week seven three more to go, but then we'll uh, look at somehow uh, continuing the conversation uh, as the year continues. Uh, so join us if you can next week, uh, same time when we will be hearing from Jill Speziak Jedliga. Uh, she's the executive director of Buffalo Niagara Water yeah. And uh, they have much to say about uh, sustainability certainly and have done as JD said, it's about uh, action and uh, thinking and doing, and they sure do the thinking and doing in our community. Uh, mm -hmm. Much of the waterfront uh, is being revived because of the efforts of the Buffalo mm -hmm. Niagara Waterkeeper. Yeah. Uh, so, and the focus that they've had in that area. So, uh, come on back next week if you can. These are all archived at the library. Uh, check the library. YouTube channel, go to their website, and uh, you can, if you're interested in past speakers in this series, and stay connected with us uh, as we continue this journey of uh, creating a culture of sustainability. 
Thanks, folks. See you next week. Thanks, guys.